A sliver of consciousness cut through what should have been unbreakable sleep. Little glimpses of events flashed through Vikas's mind. However, they didn't seem to fit into a meaningful timeline. It was difficult to tell if the fragmented images were memory or dream. His mind was still murky. Where was the switch that turned all of this off? The sliver widened and more awareness began to trickle through. Unwillingly, the gears ground and grated as his senses began to stir. At first, the only thing he could be sure of was a sharp pain somewhere behind his left eye. Or was it just above? He had a headache. His mouth was dry. He was somewhere in between being drunk and hungover. Unfortunately, he felt the worst of both. Slowly, he realized his headache was not quite the steady drone he thought it was. Instead, it came in pulses and rhythmic bursts. Clarity came through, but only in small bits and pieces. At first, the sound in his head was like someone hitting a massive wrought iron container with a wooden stick. At a distance, deep, resonant thuds. The thuds were in sequence, maybe even some sort of rhythm. With each beat, the sound seemed to get louder. Eventually, he realized that the sound wasn't in his head at all. It was drums. It was an ensemble of dholwalas. First, he heard the bass drums thudding in unison, so loud they rattled his windows. Dup, 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 dup. Then, it was the sheer number of dholes that hit him. Their rhythm was almost drowned out by their volume. Finally, cymbals came to the fore. Shrill, so loud, they felt like a drill running inside his skull. Vikas was awake. Every alcohol-soaked cell in his body screamed for sleep. They had no chance of being heard over the racket. He buried his head deep into his pillow. He put another pillow over his head. It didn't work. The sound only grew. Suddenly, a human voice burst through loudspeakers, startling him. His body had been jump-started. Any hope of going back to sleep? gone. The voice was amplified through a massive stack of speakers, but it seemed like the person with the microphone was unaware of this. The man stretched his lungs as if they needed to overpower the drums unaided. Clearly, he didn't understand the function of a microphone. Vikas forced one eye open and reached for his phone. 5.23 a.m., it said, before he had to put it away. The light from the screen hurt his open eye. The blanket of sleep had already been snatched away. He felt the brunt of the oral assault he was under. The sound outside was in perfect sync with the throbbing in his head. At least, something was in sync. His senses were now functioning, just enough to make him aware of the terrible taste in his mouth. He had barely closed his eyes before he'd been woken up. He might have been better off had he not fallen asleep at all. If Vikas could distract himself long enough, the procession would pass. People normally gravitate towards the path of least resistance. The sensible approach would be to get a glass of water, make a trip to the loo and go back to bed, deleting the incident from the archive of consequential events. Going back to sleep when it was the only thought he could conjure shouldn't have been a difficult task, in theory. This wasn't one of those mornings. When he sat up, he felt like he had a roll of cling film wrapped around his head. Everything looked hazy and his breath was short. He dragged himself out of bed. When he tried to open his window, he felt what he imagined a car crash might feel like. He slammed it shut. Following protocol, he gathered his phone and wallet before leaving the house. If somebody asked him where he was going, he wouldn't have had a good answer. He probably wouldn't have an answer at all. An answer would require him to string a sequence of words together. As the numbers in the elevator counted down, he looked at himself in the mirror. He looked exactly like he felt. Unfortunately for him, he was now beginning to string thoughts together. Unlike clean thread, fresh off the spool, his thoughts were messy. They resembled the leftovers in a sewing kit, small snippets, 
tangled and knotted over years of neglect. The cool morning air hit his face. It felt good. With each step, his feet hit the concrete hard. It wasn't long before he stood at his gate. Before him was the source of everything that was wrong with the world, the monster that had to be slain. Two chariots, each over one story high, formed the centerpiece of a procession that included at least 300 people, most of them clad in yellow. They flooded the streets, singing, dancing, and rattling little handheld cymbals. Some of them waved flags over their heads. To Vikas's surprise, there were bystanders on both sides of the street, cheering them along, clapping to the vile rhythm. Chariots came to a halt. Standing on top of one of the chariots was the man with the microphone. He danced as he sang bhajans. The word sang used as a courtesy that need not have been shown. Behind the chariots was a generator van, powering the massive towers of sound. It spewed clouds of dark smoke. The rhythm picked up. It didn't seem possible, but the man on the mic began to yell even louder. The gaps in his voice and heavy breathing confirmed his dance was at fever pitch. Now that Vikas stood beside the procession, the sound felt like it was coming from within him. The pain was unbearable. The first streaks of daylight were breaking through the sky. A few people were out on their morning walks. They seemed unaffected by the behemoth in the middle of the street. They glanced towards it and moved on. Vikas was already walking towards the front of the procession. It engulfed the width of the street. There was no traffic. Cars were making U-turns at the far end of the street. It was only when Vikas had a plan of attack did he realize his agenda included more than watching from the sides. There was no easy approach. No representative he could speak to about filing a complaint. It had to be done the hard way. Whatever it takes, he thought to himself. Since there wasn't an obvious place to start, he'd start at the beginning. The footpath was crowded. Progress through the bystanders was slow. As he passed the heart of the monster, the drummers were so loud, a tingling sensation passed through him, numbing all feeling. At the front of the procession, he sized up the horde of dancing priests, all of them seemed completely disconnected from reality. They were lost in their frenzy. Vikas walked up to one of them. The man was wearing a saffron dhoti and not much else. A cloth sling was draped across his shoulder. Gently, he tapped the man on his shoulder. He tried to avoid contact with the man's bare, sweaty skin. The priest never broke stride. He spun around and caught Vikas in an embrace. While his face wore a smile that would outshine the sun, the priest's move took Vikas by shock. Vikas's face was pressed against the man's hairy, sweaty chest. He was filled with a whiff of the priest's odor. He felt violated. Instinctively, he pushed the man back, pulling his face away from the slick, hot dampness. The priest looked confused. He smiled and pulled some sweets from his sling. Hari Om, he bellowed into Vikas's face. A fresh wave of rage hit Vikas. He knocked the sweets out of the priest's hand and unleashed the loudest volley of words he could imagine. What the fuck is wrong with you people? It's 5.30 a.m. Who the fuck gave you permission to do this? He screeched. His voice cracked. It was a mere trickle in the sea of noise around him. Only those uncomfortably close to him registered the disturbance. Shut this thing down right now. People are trying to sleep, Vikas screamed. A small pocket of commotion formed around him. Still the sound from the drums engulfed everything else. A second priest stepped in. He seemed calmer than the rest. He walked up to Vikas in an attempt to defuse the situation. He gestured for them to move to the side of the street. Vikas complied. It happened quickly. Some of the other priests, annoyed by the hindrance to their procession, prodded at Vikas, trying to hasten his departure from their midst. After all, they had to get back to their dancing. One of them, there was no way to tell which one, got a little carried away. He might have slipped, because what priest should shove a fellow man with malice? Vikas felt a strong push between his shoulder blades. His balance had been shaky all morning. He stumbled forward. 
With his arms flailing everywhere, he managed to stay on his feet. A surge of adrenaline shot through him. It took over. He dropped his shoulders, drew on all his strength and drove straight into the group of priests. One of them had shoved him. There was no point trying to pick him out. With one solid tackle, Vikas brought two men to the ground and knocked another three off balance. He got back to his feet. The assault on their brethren transformed the priests into an angry horde. Vikas could see what was coming his way but could do nothing to prevent it. The priests descended upon the violator, smothering him with their numbers. Brotherly love was temporarily on hold. The melee didn't last very long. Every moment it did, more people joined in. It wasn't just the priests. Regular devotees in plain clothes decided to participate as well. Vikas felt a fist crash into his face just below his left eye. It rocked Vikas. He had never been hit like that before. It disoriented him completely. One of those godmen had a solid right hook. Vikas swung his arms wildly and landed a few stray punches. Still, it didn't take long for the resistance to break down. A couple of well-placed blows to his back did the trick. Vikas folded under the sheer numbers he was up against. He fell to the ground, overwhelmed by a sea of bodies ready to crash down on him. He lay in the fetal position. The men rained a shower of wooden sandals down on him. He could no longer distinguish individual blows. Some of the men wore yellow, some wore saffron, and some wore shorts and a yellow cap. All their feet hurt. People noticed the scuffle and jostled for a view. The dancing continued. Bystanders were still waving from both sides of the street. The priests who pummeled Vikas returned quickly to the adoration coming their way. Eventually, some men dragged Vikas to the footpath. He slumped against the shutter of a store that was yet to open. A black SUV made its way through the crowd. It took a while, but it managed to find a way through to Vikas. The doors opened and three men in plain clothes stepped out. Behind them, a group of police constables diverted the crowd away from the vehicle. The men walked up to Vikas and picked him up. Vikas's vision was blurry. Still, he could make out the man in the passenger seat as the windows slid down. The man raised two fingers and beckoned. The men dragged Vikas to the vehicle. Vikas felt heavy open slaps to the back of his head before he was bundled into the back seat. He wasn't out of the woods. The adrenaline was wearing off and his eyes felt heavy. Slowly, the realization dawned. He was in a vehicle with four men who had given him no indication of who they were. None of them were in uniform. A wave of panic hit him. He lunged for the door handle with his one free arm. He tried to yell but only managed a loud gurgle. His struggle was easily contained. A precise elbow to his chest and a strong right to his jaw drained all his might and most of his remaining consciousness. For the second time that morning, Vikas woke up in considerable discomfort. His head was still throbbing, but there were more pressing concerns. He touched his cheek. It was swollen. When he tried to open his eyes, the left one didn't. A sharp pain originated from his chest and radiated through his body. Slowly his eyes adjusted to his surroundings. A sudden bout of panic hit him. He was in a strange room. Immediately, he reached for his pockets. He was wearing the shorts he wore to sleep. There was no sign of his phone or wallet. Flashes of events started trickling into the light. They weren't in chronological order. He rummaged through the information as it came, trying to piece the story together. There were bruises on his body. He remembered being in bed and leaving home early in the morning. Where was he now? How long had he been there? He looked around through his one good eye. The room looked vaguely familiar. He didn't know why. Was it from a film he'd seen? From the time he'd filed a complaint when Kapil's car had been broken into? From getting someone out of a drunk driving predicament? The Oshiwara police station wasn't as alien to him as it should have been. The holding cell at the back of the room was small, 
around the size of the second bedroom in a rented Oshiwara apartment. Inside, two skinny men lay on the floor, drifting in and out of sleep. A steady stench came from that direction. Vikas sat up on the wooden bench he'd found himself on. At least those drums are gone, he thought. There was a reasonable amount of activity outside the window. Waking up on the bench and not inside the cell seemed like a small victory. He looked towards the constable, scribbling furiously in a journal. His desk was by the door. Bassa, bassa, the constable said when Vikas tried to get to his feet. Though he didn't speak Marathi, Vikas understood the instruction. He sat back down. The clock on the wall read 12.42. He had been there the entire morning. His mind went back to Amina. A rush of anxiety went through him. Sir, mira phone or wallet? He said. The constable did not look up from his desk. Sa baake dekega. Aap betho, he said. Vikas appreciated the fact that he got a response in Hindi. He lifted his t-shirt and examined the bruises on his chest. Some color was beginning to form. His face felt puffy and sore. He didn't want to know what it looked like. The fan that stood in the corner suddenly stuttered and then came to life. Vikas wondered if his parents knew where he was. Good morning, a deep voice echoed in the room. Vikas looked up at a tall man in a crisply ironed inspector's uniform. Black Ray-Ban aviators were perched on his nose. Vikas wondered if the words coming from below a thick, well-kept moustache were directed at him. Hope you are comfortable, the man said. He spoke with a strong Maharashtrian accent. English wasn't his first language, but he spoke it well. He held a pink cardboard file in his hands. My name is Inspector Kamble, the man said. Good morning, sir. Why am I here? Vikas asked. That is something you must tell us, the man responded. He took the file over to the constable at the desk. The two policemen had a conversation in Marathi. Vikas didn't understand it. As far as he could tell, they weren't talking about him. Would you like some tea and biscuits? The inspector asked, turning to Vikas. No, thank you, Vikas responded. Would you like to call a doctor to have a look at your wounds? No, thank you. I would rather leave and go see a doctor myself. Unfortunately, that cannot happen immediately. We have some formalities that have to be done before you go anywhere, the inspector said. Vikas felt sick. What formalities, he asked. Young man, I don't know what you can remember because your breath still smells of alcohol, but you have assaulted pundits and party workers. We have also found drugs in your possession, he said. He pulled out a transparent plastic bag with Vikas's piece of hash inside it. It also held a single condom, the one Vikas kept in his wallet for emergencies. He now knew where his phone and wallet were. Do you also have my phone? Can I talk to my parents? He asked. I have already spoken to your father this morning. I told him there was an incident and that you are here. You will appreciate that we assured him there was no need for him to come here. Why trouble elderly people? He pulled out his own phone and offered it to Vikas. I'm sure they will be eager to hear from you. Vikas took the phone and dialed. His father answered. He barely said hello before the barrage of questions from the other end began. Where have you disappeared? What have you done? At least inform us about these things. The policeman told us you are not even in the station, so there's no point coming down there. Are you okay? His father asked, clearly flustered. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. This will just take a bit of time. I'll see you in a bit. I'm coming straight home after. I can't talk for long now, Vikas said. He wasn't sure what he was dealing with and saw no need to worry his parents. Now, young man, if you are feeling fine, the boss would like to have a word with you. He will decide if you are going to go home and face your parents or if they have to come here with their lawyer. It didn't sound like a threat, but it felt like one. The constable handed Vikas a bottle of mineral water and helped him to his feet. Vikas was relieved when he felt the seal crack. He put it to his lips and drained close to half the bottle. The inspector placed his hand on Vikas's shoulder and guided him out of the room. They walked through a narrow passage with doors on one side. The other side overlooked an open yard. It was bright outside. Naturally, Vikas's eyes squinted. 
This caused a sharp pain in his left cheek. They made their way up a narrow stairway. An identical corridor greeted them on the first floor. Vikas saw a man smoking a cigarette, leaning on a pillow. The man's gaze followed him. Vikas recognized him. He was the man from the vehicle he'd been thrown into. You have already met Pritam Bhai? The inspector said as they walked past him. No words were exchanged. The chair creaked as Vikas shifted in it. The man sitting across the table was engaged in conversation over the phone. It had been a long time since Vikas had seen a black landline with a rotary dial. It seemed perfectly at home on the desk in front of him. Next to it was a little wooden sign that read, ACP Mohan Chitnavis. As soon as his phone call ended, the man looked up at the inspector. He continued to ignore Vikas. He was not in uniform. His collared half-sleeve shirt had a cell phone-shaped bulge in its breast pocket. Vikas thought the phone looked a lot like his own. The ACP spoke to the inspector about the contents of the file that sat open on his desk. He seemed like someone who was accustomed to black eyes and bruised egos. Vikas noticed the ACP licked his finger each time he flipped through the pages of the file in front of him. As he read, he pressed down with his finger on the page. And suddenly, with a quick motion, he flicked it across, making a swishing sound. He didn't seem pleased with the contents of the file. The inspector stood by his side. He only contributed to the conversation by nodding his head. Vikas didn't understand the Marathi the ACP spoke. One of the three cell phones on the table rang. The ACP scowled at it before he disconnected. He seemed like he blamed the phone for the call that had disturbed him. Mr. Das, the ACP said, once the inspector left the room. What is the situation you have created? Sir, I need to be back home soon. My parents are not sure where I am. Can you please let me know what formalities need to be done? Vikas asked. Formalities? The ACP asked. He opened up another register. He flicked through the green pages, again licking his finger each time he did so. There was an incident in the morning and we must know your version of the story before we proceed any further. The ACP's accent was not as thick as the inspector's before him. Sir, I don't want to get involved with any police cases. I was beaten up, but isn't it my prerogative to choose whether or not I would like to pursue a police complaint? Vikas asked. Prerogative? The ACP looked up from his journal. Young man, I will try to be very clear so that there is no misunderstanding. Can you please explain to me what you think is happening here? He asked. Yes, I got beaten up by some priests and then some goons came and finished the job, Vikas said. The ACP raised his palm indicating for Vikas to stop. Would you like some tea? He asked. No, thank you. I would like to go home, Vikas said. He could no longer hold back the anxiety building up inside him. That is out of the question right now, the ACP said. He made some notes. Vikas tried to look into the register to catch a glimpse of what the man was writing. He couldn't tell what the words were. He did, however, notice the impeccable handwriting the man had. The ACP wrote in ink, but it looked like it could pass for a nice cursive typeface. The words were perfectly spaced, evenly rounded and consistent. Let me tell you about what you have done this morning. Sometimes it is difficult to remember after many drinks. You have assaulted holy men completely unprovoked. You have vandalized a religious gathering, and when party workers came in to try and keep the peace, you assaulted them as well. He pointed his pen at Vikas. Vikas felt a void in his stomach. His pain was slowly fading into the background. The consequences of his action were coming into focus. Holy men and political workers were involved. Nothing was straightforward when they were involved. Now that part we already know. What we cannot understand is why a respectable young man like you would do something like this. Maybe it's because of the alcohol and drugs? I think it is best for you only to tell us, the ACP said. Vikas had no response. He couldn't find a way to spin this. He wished he could go back in time and just stay in bed. The thought didn't help, but it stayed with him. Is this some sort of protest against the religious procession, the government, the party? Please tell me. I would like to make sense of all of this, the ACP continued. He spoke in a monotone. The matter has escalated. The party leaders are involved. You have beaten up one of the senior people. They are demanding answers. I need to tell them something. The ACP paused, giving Vikas a chance to speak. Vikas said nothing. How many drinks did you have last night? 
How much drugs did you take? The ACP asked. Must be lots to us all pundits singing bhajans, no? You know, I understand when people get into a fight at the bar, when someone misbehaves with their wives and girlfriends. I understand when someone hits someone to defend themselves, but holy men singing bhajans peacefully? Please tell me, young man. So it was not that. The procession was extremely loud at 5 a.m. and I just went to see if they could move it along quicker or turn the volume down. There has to be some consideration for other people. How do they even get permission to do this at 5 a.m.? Vikas asked. The question is already out there before he realized who had probably granted permission. Young man, the ACP said. For the first time, he looked Vikas straight in the eye. In my opinion, at this stage, I feel you must not worry about why the police decides to give or not to give permissions. The problems that you are facing are of more importance. It is not a small matter. It is not like you have picked a fight with some ordinary fellow on the street. You have beaten up the party's men and they are demanding answers. Did you see Mr. Pritham waiting outside? He walks directly with the CM. He is waiting for me to provide answers. There was silence in the room. The ACP shut the journal and placed the pen inside a cup on his desk. Now tell me this, he said. Please pay attention because it's important. He reached into his drawer and pulled out a sheet of paper. He looked at it, his nose wrinkled. I know there must be a hangover, but please. Are you this Vikas Das who runs an advertising company? Yes, sir, but I don't run it anymore. What is this about? Please pay attention to what I'm asking. You do not need to ask questions, the ACP responded. He read through the document he held in his hand. Do you understand what it means when the CM himself is involved in a situation like this? Even I was surprised when I got a call from his office. Vikas could not comprehend why the chief minister would possibly be interested in a scuffle. What was he missing? Did something happen that might have slipped through his memory? The CM is a good man. He cares deeply for his people. He's very upset that someone tried to attack his party workers. Not only that... He's also hurt that you picked a fight with the pundits. Very honestly, so am I. But I will not let sentiment get in the way of my job. Are you anti-national? You seem like a good Hindu boy. No, sir. No such thing. Sir, I'm sure incidents like this happen all the time. I don't understand why the CM is involved in something like this, Vikas said. I have already told you to answer my questions, not ask me yours. There are many things you don't understand which is why you have put yourself in this situation. You think I don't have better things to do with my time than to sit and talk to you? The ACP snapped at Vikas. The two men sat in momentary silence. Vikas felt like a child sitting at the principal's office. He knew he was in more trouble than he could conceive. The ACP regained his composure. Now I'm telling you again. Listen to me very carefully. Assault on a priest... Disturbing a religious function, vandalism, assaulting party workers and possession of narcotics? These are some very serious charges. Do not take them lightly. Vikas knew this wasn't a situation he could resolve by slipping some cash to a cop. Some of these can be considered non-bailable offences, depending on how the judge sees it. If I write up your charge sheet now, I will have to place you under arrest. It didn't seem like an empty threat. I have told the CM that you seem like a good person that got stuck in a bad situation. It does happen sometimes. He has taken personal interest in the matter, Vikas felt uneasy. He wants to give you an opportunity to explain your actions to him in person. He feels you deserve a second chance before we file the FIR. He does not want to ruin a good person's life if it was all just a misunderstanding. The ACP rang a bell that sat on the side of his desk. A constable showed up and snapped off a quick salute at the ACP before waiting for instructions. Sheikh will take you to your home. Please go home and clean yourself up. If you want, you can go see a doctor. Spend some time with your parents and explain to them what you have done. They also have a right to know. You have a few hours, Sheikh will wait with you. Then you must come back here by 6 o'clock. When you are back, I will take you along with me to the CM's residence. He has been gracious enough to meet with you in person. None of what the man said made any sense to Vikas, but he didn't argue. I do not need to tell you to dress appropriately. It is important, for your sake, that you make a good impression on the CM. Vikas nodded. 
the acb pulled vikas's phone out of his pocket and handed it over to him he gave the constable detailed instructions he was empathetic about the need to be back by 6 pm one moment the acp said as vikas slid his chair back to stand up he reached back into his drawer and pulled out vikas's wallet he placed it on the table before him please check your belongings they should all be in place except the narcotics we found inside that has been confiscated vikas didn't bother he picked up his wallet and put it in his pocket along with his phone he was in no mood to argue over the condom which was no longer in there thank you sir he said he walked out of the room followed by the constable pritham was still standing on the corridor he slipped into the acp's office once vikas was at the staircase the constable drove vikas home in a police car the entire morning felt like a dream vikas couldn't wake up from he could barely keep his eyes open he was in no condition to find a solution to his predicament he didn't even understand his predicament just a little nap everything will be better after he thought the car entered his compound it drew attention the watchman gave him a curious look vikas wondered how much of that morning's incident he had seen a few curtains parted and eyes followed him from the car to the lobby he wasn't sure what the constable would do until 6 in the evening was he supposed to have him wait in his house vikas had his keys but he decided to ring the bell his mother opened the door both his parents were in the living room they looked anxious one look at his condition only made it worse the fact that a policeman stood behind him didn't help either what the hell happened his mother finally asked she was visibly shaken where have you been she grabbed him by the shoulder it's okay mom it's really fine it's not as bad as it looks can you calm down so i can explain all of it vikas asked his parents looked towards the constable why is he here his father asked this is shake he is just dropping me home vikas said pani lenge aap his mother asked the constable declined madam sare 5 baje mein inhe lene aa jaunga acb saab ka order hai 6 baje wapas station pahunchana hai the constable said kis liye vikas's father asked acb saab inke saath cm saab se milne jayenge sham ko so please time pe ready ho jana he said before leaving he was oblivious to how alien his words seemed to vikas's parents Are you in trouble? Is he here to protect you? What the hell happened to your face? His father burst out the moment the doors closed behind the constable. Dad, sit down. I'll tell you all about it. Everything is fine. He's just here to make sure I'm not late in the evening. Vikas saw his mother's eyes fill up. Mom, it's nothing. It's just swollen. It's not bad at all. I can see fine. Please just sit down. I'll tell you everything. It just looks bad but it isn't. It's just a silly incident. I would slap you if your face wasn't already bruised, she said. Her voice quivered. Please just sit. You want some water? he asked. Vikas told them about the morning. He wasn't emotional, he wasn't defensive. He just laid out the simple chronology of events. He told them about the procession and the dust up that led to his trip to the police station. He only omitted the part where he was knocked unconscious. It was not a lie as much as an attempt to keep them from undue stress. When the conversation with the ACP came up, he told them about the hash. He was however clear that it wasn't at the heart of the issue. The ACP is taking me to meet the CM so we can clear this mess up. By tomorrow it will all be over. They probably just want to make sure I'm not some hater of their party or a terrorist or something, he said. His attempt to smile caused him pain. They do not take terrorists to meet leaders, his father said. I'm sure they've established I'm not one. I will tell you exactly how it goes, but for now, can you just calm down? It's really not that bad, Vikas said. He had no idea how bad it really was. It took around half an hour for his parents' hysteria to subside. They were still upset, but much calmer. It was almost two o'clock. You have to see a doctor, his mother said to him. Mom, I'm really fine. I just need to get a couple of hours of sleep before I leave. I'll go to the doctor first thing tomorrow, he said. Have you eaten anything all day? Don't sleep before you get something to eat, she said. Vikas didn't feel like eating. All he wanted to do was to fall into his bed and never wake up. He did, however, 
realized there was no sense in arguing with his mother. He sat in the living room eating parathas with some curd. His parents sat across from him, still stunned. Why didn't you at least call his father asked. They take your phone. It's the first thing they do when they take you in. The inspector on the ACP only came by 11:30. The constables didn't know anything, so we had to wait for someone senior to come in before anything could be done, Vikas said. How is the CM involved? Doesn't he have more important things to do? His mother asked. I'm not sure yet. Apparently some of the people involved with the procession are close to him. His party supports it. It was just by chance that they were the ones involved, he said. You know these kind of people are not like the watchmen you bribe to smuggle drinks for you. They have people killed if things don't go their way, his father said. Dad, don't be dramatic. Nobody is getting killed at the CM's residence. They could have had me arrested and in jail, but they invited me for dinner instead. What do you mean they can throw you in jail? What were the charges? Disturbing the peace. Should we talk to a lawyer? We have to talk to someone before he goes. Talk about what? Let's at least find out what this is. I'm not going to jail. I'm going to the CM's house. If I came back home saying I have a meeting with the chief minister under any other circumstances, you won't be stressed. You would be excited, Vikas said. These aren't any other circumstances. Look at your face, his mother said. Once he finished his meal, Vikas considered a shower. He needed one after the morning he'd had, but the urge to close his eyes was just too strong. The only thing he did before laying down was set an alarm. Once his head hit the pillow, sleep found him instantly. For the first time that day, Vikas woke up to an alarm he'd set for himself. While his upper body and his face still hurt, he felt a lot better. He knew he would go back to sleep if he lay in bed. It was too late in the day to pick that route. There was a terrible taste in his mouth. It was a combination of wine, blood and the fact that he hadn't brushed his teeth that morning. He spent some time under the shower before he got ready. He walked into the living room wearing a pair of jeans and a plain black t-shirt. He felt better than he had all day. It wasn't saying much. His parents were waiting for him. "How are you feeling?" his mother asked. "I could sleep for a few more hours, but otherwise great," he said. His face had stiffened up further and smiling hurt even more. "You cannot wear that to meet the CM," his father said. "Go put on a shirt. You can borrow my jacket. Take the navy blue one." Also put on some trousers. Do you want to wear my shoes? What are you wearing on your feet? Dad, I'm not going to his wedding. I'm going to his house for dinner. It's okay, Vikas replied. Before the debate could escalate, the doorbell rang. Come with me, his father said. He grabbed Vikas by the arm and marched him to his room. The constable was at the door and his father went out to greet him. Vikas heard his parents offer him a seat. Bas 2 minute aur. Chai pani kuch? Both his parents walked into his room and locked the door behind him. Now listen carefully. From the time you leave here, I want you to have SOS typed and ready to send to me on your WhatsApp. If for whatever reason you get into any sort of trouble, I want you to make sure you get that message away. Be smart about it. Keep WhatsApp open on your home screen. If I get that message, I will have a lawyer come down to the police station or the CM's bungalow. I have already spoken to Hari uncle and his lawyer has been informed his father said His voice was soft but that did not take away from the urgency of his words Dad don't speak to other people about it until you know what this is Vikas said Listen these are not people you take lightly Just tell me you understand what I'm saying any trouble make sure you get that message away get it ready now Vikas nodded Both his parents gave him a hug Soon he was on his way back to the police station accompanied by constable Ahmed Saqib Sheikh